Visualization of Ecological Niche Models by Luis Escobar. One of the challenges of ecological niche modeling is model interpretation and also model design. Generally, we think only in the geographic space and we do the interpretation of the models in geographic space only. However, ecological niche modeling theory was conceived in the environmental dimension. So the goal of this presentation is trying to encourage you to design your models and do the interpretation of your models in the environmental space. Thinking only in the geographic space and developing the interpretation of your models in the geographic space only will add bias and will limit uh, the understanding of what your models are actually doing. So avoid the geographic bias. Goals or, or goal in ecological niche modeling generally is trying to understand the geographic potential of species. So maps are the final goal. However, we should start thinking more in environmental potential of species and more specifically in the environmental limits of species which we know is a key factor in understanding distributional ecology. For example, in the arrow here, I have a single location with uh, the temperature of 16 Celsius degrees in Australia for the month of June. All the other points here are exactly duplicates of the red location. That means that in geographic space, we may think that the species can occur in all these geographic areas and that maybe these species can tolerate a diversity of landscapes. When in fact, if we think in the environmental space only, this bulk of points are a single point in the environmental space. For example, in this geographic region, we have a transect showing different landscape conditions. Some geographic areas have landscape that occur in a restricted space and other geographic areas have environmental conditions that occur in broad, in broad uh, space. In the environmental dimensions, however, we have a single point resembling the broad geographic gray area. And this shows also that the yellow area is very close in environmental space, even when it's far in the geographic space. We also see here that the green environment, environmental conditions are very diverse and occupy um, a considerable environmental space here. However, in the geographic space, uh, they occupy only a few uh, uh, areas. This could be due, for example, in the case of a uh, uh, desert here in which we have broad geographic areas that are homogeneous, so the variability is small. And here, maybe a volcano or a mountain in which we have a, an important gradient of environmental conditions in a small geographic area. This is another example of the uh, differences in environmental space versus geographic space. And here you can see that, for example, Quito and Guayaquil, two important cities of Ecuador, are very close geographically. However, both areas, both locations are far from Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. If we think in environmental conditions or environmental dimension like temperature and precipitation, we see now that Rio de Janeiro and Guayaquil are very close environmentally. However, Quito is far from Guayaquil in environmental conditions. This is because Rio de Janeiro and Guayaquil are coastal areas with 
high temperatures, while Guayaquil has lower temperatures uh, because it's located in the Andes mount in the Andes mountains of South America. The overall goal of developing ecological niche models is using geographic information to calibrate ecological niche models that then we use to project to the geography to identify potential areas suitable for many species. So everything that happens in ecological niche models occurs in environmental dimensions, even when we don't see that when the model is under calibration. Indeed, if we think in environmental space, we have the opportunity to understand uh, what are the tolerances or the uh, ages of my species niche. Or for example, what's the um, uh, population growth in terms of different locations in the niche space. We can also use the environmental space to identify how different or similar are the different niches of different species to understand a niche evolution. All these uh, assessments could be done in environmental space and geographic space, but using only the geographic space can limit our model interpretation. I have three examples, one aquatic, one terrestrial, and one virtual. Uh, to show why we need to think more in environmental dimensions. This is an example of uh, a species, an algae, living in fresh waters uh, in the United Kingdom where this species is endangered and, and is of conservation concern. The same species, however, is invasive in North America this is the distribution estimated for the species in North America. And an opportunity uh, to understand why these species uh, have low performance or low fitness in the native range may be due to the location of those populations in the species niche as compared with the um, distribution of these species in the invaded areas of North America. We can also identify other areas of North America that the species could um, invade. That will require, in the first place, the identification of the species tolerances to specific env environmental conditions, so a proxy of the environmental niche of the species. Then we can reconstruct the conditions of the area of interest, in this case, Minnesota in Northern North America. So we can identify if the conditions in Minnesota overlap with the species uh, niche to identify which areas in Minnesota are suitable for the species. Maybe the uh, conditions in Minnesota occur here, or maybe all the conditions in Minnesota are suitable for the species and the species could invade all the areas in Minnesota. Or maybe there are no areas in Minnesota that are suitable for the species. And this interpretation uh, is really easy to develop in environmental dimensions as compared with only the use of maps. If we want to develop models uh, in future climate for this species, then we also need to develop uh, environmental interpretations or interpretations in the environmental space. For example, we have our occurrence points of the species, um, and we have the present day climatic conditions, and we want to project the model to future climatic conditions, novel climatic conditions that do not exist in the present uh, 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 present day. That helps to understand what's going to be the response of my, my model to the novel climatic conditions. And we can identify what's the trend of my model under present day and future climate 
and the different responses to future climate and the different um, conditions of the different future climate models. All these evaluations are very limited when we think only in geographic space. This is the uh, example of uh, terrestrial species. And the question here was the uh, extent at which ecological niche model modeling could be relevant to identify species limits. This uh, study was done with uh, three species of opossums in South America. And in the map, you can see that these three species occur in three different areas. And the models actually uh, reconstruct very well the occurrences of the species. However, when developing the analysis in environmental space, we can see that actually uh, the species are very similar. And indeed, uh, it, we were unable to identify significant differences uh, in the models when thinking in environmental dimensions. And the final conclusion of this study was that ecological niche modeling act is actually weak uh, as an approach to identify species limits. Now I'm going to show a couple of examples of virtual species presented by my colleague Yushi Chao in the um, International Biogeography, Biogeography Society meeting in 2018. The black points here show the present day climatic conditions in the world. And then a, a virtual species that this is this ellipsoid in gray. And you can see that there are some areas for which we don't have a black points or for which we don't have a current climatic conditions. So the species is restricted to the conditions that currently exist in the world. Uh, so this, this uh, red convex hole. And the species may not be using all the areas that are suitable. So it's restricted only a few areas. And we call it the realized niche. So more specifically, this may be the fundamental niche. But because all the conditions may not exist, we call it an existential niche. And then the areas that the species is actually using, uh, we call it the realized niche. But we may be unable to take samples from the entire realized niche. So we have just a subset, the observable niche, from which we have samples. With this small portion of data, we are calibrating our ecological niche models. So you see with that with a small portion of the observed data, we try to reconstruct the realized niche, the existence, existential niche, and the fundamental niche. That's the big limitation of ecological niche modeling. In this example, the same virtual species is projected to the geographic space. And you can see here the existential niche, the red convex hole, shows all the potential of the species to survive in the geographic space. If we consider the realized niche only in South America, I have the, the zoom in of that area here. And we have samples only in the areas from which we have more people in dark blue here. Then this is the small amount of data that we have to reconstruct the full potential of the species. And that's the main challenge of ecological niche modeling trying to reconstruct species environmental tolerances from a small amount of information. I have the same species here, the fundamental niche or uh, existential niche and the realized niche, assuming that we have samples from the entire species range. We see that using a simple uh, GLM model, uh, general linear model with quadratic notations. We are able to reconstruct the species fundamental niche even when we have a limited amount of data. And the models predict highest suitability in the core areas of the niche. If you use a machine learning algorithm, another algorithm, based on kernel density estimations uh, in the uh, environmental space, we see that the model this time 
predicts higher suitability in the areas where there is more data for the fundamental underrealized niche. So it's biased towards the amount of data available. If we use Marble, uh, an algorithm that identifies clusters of occurrences in environmental space, you see that the model is good to predict the areas only based on the data available for the fundamental and the realized niche. If you use Maxent, a machine learning algorithm, uh, the default uh, configuration, you see that with a good amount of data, the model is able to predict high suitability in the areas where that are close in the centroid of the niche. However, if you have limited amount of data, the model overfits to the areas in environmental space that have more data. If you use Maxent uh, with a specific parameters, in this case quadratic, the model identify areas suitable with high suitability that are nonsensical and require a more attention, more, more attention. I'm sorry. This is a comparison of two models in environmental space, kernel density estimation, identifying a high density of points in environmental space, and marble, identifying clusters of points in environmental space, points based on occurrences of these species. And you can see that even when these two models have a very similar uh, theoretical approaches, they generate models with different shape in environmental space. So conclusions for this presentation is that first, model interpretation is difficult if you restrict your interpretation to the geographic space only. These two models have the same data and different approaches. The first is based on a logistic uh, model, a Maxent model, and you see that highest suitability is predicted in the areas where there are more points. However, niche A using the same environmental variables and the same occurrences predict higher suitability in completely different areas because the uh, assumptions are different. Mm -hmm. So if you restrict your interpretation of these two maps only to geographic space, your interpretation may be incomplete. The second conclusion is that you require an environmental space to identify the amount of equilibrium of your species, ecological equilibrium. In this case, we have a virtual species that resembles a full moon, high equilibrium, and we develop models with incomplete, amount of, uh, incomplete amounts of data. In this case, a very small amount of data. So here, with this amount of data, we calibrate the full maxim model, and you see that highest suitability is predicted in the areas uh, in environmental space where we have more points. And when we develop a model selection uh, with uh, like 3,000 different models, maxim models with different regularization values and features, it, the model mirrors what we see in the default model. If we assume that our species is going to have a quadratic response to the environmental variables, using a small amount of data, the model is able to reconstruct the fundamental niche, that is, areas from which we don't have information, and predicts high suitability in the core areas of the niche. In this example, you can see that when using all the features and changing the regularization, the model has different amounts of overfit to the data available. When we increase the data, the pattern is consistent. Maxen over fits to the data available and predicts high suitability to the environmental conditions where there is more data. The same happens when, we, when, you, when you increase the amount of data and the equilibrium is higher, but is unable to reconstruct the fundamental niche of the species as compared with a more simple model based on a quadratic feature. If you have a full amount of data, a full moon, 
re that uh, represents data from the entire fundamental niche. Of default maxim, a very uh, carefully selected maxim or a simple maxim with a quadratic feature is able to reconstruct the niche of these pieces. The third conclusion is that model comparison, for example, if you want to see if a species A is similar or not to species B, requires an environmental interpretation. You will be, you will have limitations to develop a correct model interpretation if you think only in terms of maps and you neglect the distribution of the species in environmental space. Thanks.